My name is Cindy Baxter. I have been chasing deniers for 25 years um, and I am the author of Exxon Secrets where we reveal funding of the, of the denial campaign by ExxonMobil. In the early days we used to see like every day there'd be a press conference organised by the International Chamber of Commerce and the um, Global Climate Coalition is that, um, which where they would just hold press conference after press conference denying the science of climate change with Richard Lindzen, with Fred Singer and a whole bunch of those old guys. They've been around since the very early days. And, and who were the group who were behind them? It was the Global Climate Coalition and the International Chamber of Commerce, but the Global Climate Coalition in those days was just all the big oil, fossil fuel companies, big oil, big coal, big car companies and all of that. They were the whole lot swung in behind the Global Climate Coalition. And later on, um, Shell and BP were the first ones to leave and then so many others left due to public pressure that they transformed themselves into an association of associations. Uh, but then they closed their doors after Kyoto, after the US didn't sign Kyoto. So that's, that, they said their job was done. So Exxon was one of the members of the Global Climate Coalition? Exxon was a very active member, especially in the latter years, Exxon and Mobil. They were both very active members of that. And so you've, um, since then you've continued to follow Exxon's funding of, of denialist groups? That's right. Well, when Bush walked away from Kyoto, everybody went Exxon. And so that's when you know, we really started to look into Exxon a lot more. Um, and it was during those years that we decided to set up um, a website to track, to show people Exxon's funding. But not only that, I got so, we got so sick of journalists writing stories about climate science and balancing it with a denier. And it was really difficult to get on the phone and talk to somebody and say, Fred Singer is, is, is related to this think tank and that think tank and this think tank and they're all funded by ExxonMobil. So we developed a website that, had, that showed that, that whole pattern of that you know the one scientist with all these different think tanks that he, they were associated with and the funding that they all got from Exxon so that's when it really kicked off and actually that's when a lot of climate science scientists started to get angry because they realized that they thought they were having a scientific debate but they realized that actually it was very politicized and that the fossil fuel industry was behind a lot of the denial that they were fighting on a daily basis. So the scientific community was starting to become aware, what about the general public? General public not so much in those days, I mean the, the, the idea was actually to get you know, the journalists um, to, to, um, to actually acknowledge um, the, the fossil fuel funding and I don't know, it was around, it was around sort of early 2000s that there were, you know, we, we managed to get some newspapers to say every time they, they quoted one of the deniers that they would say they were industry funded and that was a huge breakthrough. That's when it really started getting going when they, they started talking about they were being industry funded. And it took a long time before they decided not to cover them at all. Could you talk about what kind of money is involved in, with Exxon? How much money have they funded to denialist groups? Well, from what we know, um, from actually from Exxon's own 990 documents, which they have to file with the Inland Revenue Department in the US, um, 30.9 30 million was spent on 49 different think tanks that were funding climate denial from 1998 to 2014. Now obviously there was money going into them before 98. Um, Mobile was a really big funder of those guys and Exxon was certainly funding them way before you know we sort of picked up the you know the, the Exxon Mobile after the merger. And uh, what other uh, ways were Exxon trying to involve I guess the, the political process or the IPCC process? Um, well not so much the IPCC process although in 2001 um, Exxon's lobbyist Brian Flannery was trying to get the words human enhanced to remove from the text of the final SPM. Oh, but, oh, this was the third assessment report? Third assessment report, yeah, the, the TAR, yeah, the third assessment report. But in the rest of it, Exxon was, um, along with all, these other, uh, with all these other companies in the GCC, they ran a really effective campaign against Kyoto. Their line was, it's not global and it won't work. And so they, they really, Lee Raymond, who was the CEO of Exxon from 93 to 2005, he was at the forefront of this with the American Petroleum Institute. And they were really pushing the idea that, what about China? What about China? And they said, you know, in so many years' time, in 10 years' time, China is going to be a bigger emitter than the US. 
But of course, China at that point was not the biggest emitter. It was nowhere near the biggest emitter, and the US was. And so they basically sort of set up this whole blame China thing, blame China in the future, blame China now, as the, you know, China's emissions started going up. And China, of course, they knew that China was not going to act and start stopping emissions, cutting emissions, until the US did, until they took that responsibility. And here in the talks, it's um, commonly known as CBDR, Common but Differentiated Responsibilities, which in the convention, the industrialised countries agreed to go first. But then, sort of in the, by the mid-90s, it was all like, what about China? And that Blame China line came from the oil industry, and it, I, I, I believe we traced it back, it actually came from Exxon. Wow. Um, could you reflect on the significance of your research into Exxon funding, given the, this latest series of articles from LA Times and Inside Climate News about well, what, what yeah. Exxon knew? Well, I think, you know, what Exxon knew, I think, you know, we, we always knew that they had very good climate scientists in the IPCC process. And I always used to look at his name and think, well, hold on, there's an Exxon funded scientist. But everyone I talked to said, no, no, he's straight up, he's a good climate scientist. And he was very good, you know, and he's still publishing. He published with people like Bert Berlin. And so we sort of knew that Exxon was doing proper science. And I know that Exxon says now that the science, the, the proper science that they were doing, that they were always transparent about it. They weren't. But then what I think the most important thing about what Exxon knew is what Exxon did next. And that was the funding of the absolute denial of, of, um, of, of climate science and the funding of these huge campaigns against the climate science. And I think, you know, there was, there was a... In 98, there was a, a memo that was published, it was an API memo, and it was basically a record of a meeting in which Exxon was at, and the Southern Company, but plus a number of think tanks that Exxon was funding. And that was, um, that, I don't know if we never knew if it, got, if it got carried out because it got leaked, but essentially it was the campaign against Kyoto, and US signing of Kyoto, and the whole premise was to, was to place uncertainty in the minds of the public and the minds of the media. And victory would be achieved when Kyoto was seen um, as an outlier. What, what, what's your comment on Exxon's response to the Inside Climate News article, so placing the emphasis on, on all the positive scientific research and, and really downplaying the misinformation? Well, exactly. Exxon's doing a complete straw man look over here. You know, that's exactly what they're doing. They're they're just completely avoiding the conversation about about denial. I've seen Exxon's talking points, and they're sticking to them rigorously. And it's all about, of course, we did proper science. Of course, we did, and that's not the point. And some people are getting that, but others are taking it, you know, on on, on board and saying, yeah, well, they did do proper climate science. But it's that's when you, but that's not looking at what Exxon did. And, you know, and Exxon's also, we've seen recently, they've been going after Inside Climate News and sort of trying to say, trying to allege that it, the Inside Climate News is a sort of, is, is a non-profit funded organisation with a particular point of view. So they've been really trying to shoot the messenger and, and, po and point everybody in a completely different direction. But, you know, we've been getting the message out that Exxon, what Exxon did was fund climate denial. It was at the centre of the climate denial campaign. The other um, defence that Exxon has is that they, the funding that they supplied to these these conservative groups wasn't necessarily for climate denial, it was, it was for possibly other purposes. Well, no, but we know that's not true because we've seen their 990s and then we've seen their, their, their documents where they have to list the funding. And there was a couple of years where they actually slipped up and um, really sort of noted in the public funding of those um, in, of, of, of their list of um, who they were funding. Uh, for, you know, they, they would say it was their climate campaigns, climate and energy research, climate education fund. And there was one year where we saw that they did very little in their public document, but then we got the 990 and they really listed out in that 990 what it was for, and it was for their climate change campaigns. It was very clear they said it themselves. Could you tell us the story about uh, your investigation into Willie Soon's links with fossil fuel companies? Well, yeah, Willie Soon was, um, he was, 
We started looking into him because um, there was, um, I mean, he was always, he was with the George C. Marshall Institute, which is an Exxon funded organization, and his cohort, um, Sally Baliunas, who was also at the Smithsonian Institute. So we started looking into the funding of these of, of these guys, and, and we, and the Smithsonian was, you know, in the US you get the very open, transparent freedom of information laws. So we applied to the Smithsonian to, to get a list of the funding that Willie soon had received and we found that from 2001 to the present day Willie soon has been funded to the tune of 1.25 million from fossil fuel only fossil fuel interests and he's only been funded by them all of his papers have been funded by those guys since 2001 so we can see that but he was funded by the American Petroleum Institute and others all the way back to the beginning of his, of his career in the, in the early 90s he's you know he, he's been linked up with those with the fossil fuel Funded of uh, funders since for his, for his entire career. And and what does the correspondence uh, between him and the fossil fuel companies that describe? Like, how do they characterise the, the research that he's providing? Well, that was very interesting because um, because well, you know you, we 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 then went back and got a second well, actually, lot. Of, could you talk about how you um, yeah. how did you get hold of that information? And then what did well, we. Happen? We then went back and got a second lot of freedom of information requests. We actually asked for the correspondence between him and his funders. And that's where it became really interesting because some of the deliverables that he listed were to give evidence based on his research to the House of, you know, on the Hill in, in um, to the House of Congress and you know and, and to Senate committees, and um, and you could it was very clear between the conversations between him and his funders that he was there to confuse the science. You know Willie Soon's big thing has been the Sun Climate Connection, which has been totally disproved. You know proved to be wrong. There is you know the connection, the graphs go in different directions. So you know you could see that he was plotting with those companies um, to actually you know to to obfuscate the science, and he was also. Also with those companies, it was it was very much, you know, it, it was a very collegial discussion. You could see that they were quite friendly. And, oh, look, I'm doing some more stuff, can you give me some more funding? And it was all very, you know, it was all very friendly. Because, you know, oh, hi. I mean, there was a point at which suddenly Exxon didn't give them any more money. And that was in a very interesting email, that one. But um, also we, we also, you know, the other thing that Willie Soon did was he, he was part of this paper in 2007 which um, said that global warming wasn't happening, the Arctic wasn't melting and polar bears were going to be fine. And that was, that was money from Exxon, the Koch brothers and the American Petroleum Institute. Uh, could you talk about this uh, latest revelation um, where, where two Greenpeace investigators have um, had went undercover and posing as fossil fuel companies? Well, that was very yeah exactly. I mean, the um, you know the Greenpeace investigation has really revealed what we thought has been happening a lot of the time. There's one particular scientist called William Happer, and uh, and and he's been he's he's given so much evidence on the hill in in Washington. He's given so much climate denying evidence, and um, he and he's basically what we've uh, Greenpeace set up a sting I guess you could call it, pretended to be a fossil fuel company and asked him if he, he and others would write papers and not disclose and uh, um, challenging um, the link between coal and climate change and, um, and, 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 and pro CO2 scientific papers but not disclose his funding and he was agreeing to do that. Another person in this investigation was um, William O'Keefe which who has a long history. He was he was head of the Global Climate Coalition. He then was at the American Petroleum Institute. He was at the George C. Marshall Institute. He's been, he's another person who's been at the center of this. There's emails in there showing him coaching, um, encouraging these guys to apply to the Donors Trust, which is a, a dark money foundation, which we know, well, we strongly suspect gets lots of fossil fuel money, try and hide, it's a, a laundering process, so nobody actually knows where the money's coming from. So he was very much encouraging a lot of these scientists to go and get money from there. The Donors Trust is like the dark money ATM. I mean, I think probably as a result of the campaigning that us and a lot of others have done, like on the Koch brothers and on Exxon funding, um, these funders were like no longer willing to actually sort of, you know, Exxon willing to sort of show their faces and actually be nailed for funding these people. And so the Donors Trust was set up, um, it's only been going for a few years, to funnel that money, to launder that money 
through to these um, denial campaigns. And so this is yeah, millions and millions have, um, have come from this trust. For example, Mark Morano and his Climate Depot, which is associated with the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, and they call themselves CFACT, he got four million to set up this trust. You know, to set, from, from the Donors Trust to set up Climate Depot. That's what we think. It wasn't because we don't actually have the details of it, but it's a very suspicious couple of different foundations that are uh, laundering process. So, so what role does the, these kind of investigations and do civil society groups like Greenpeace play in, in the, the effort to reduce emissions? Well, essentially, I mean, at the moment, you say, I mean, the U.S. is, or I mean, I think the, the most obvious example is the U.S. and the U.S.'s failure to come on board with Kyoto, the U.S.'s failure to act on climate change until very recently, um, and so that's had a, you know, the world's biggest emitter for a very long time. Um, its failure to actually do, um, to act on climate change is direct result of this climate denial because the U.S., the U.S. media, the U.S. public have been, you know. Um, very much in doubt as to whether the science is real, um, all that sort of stuff. So basically, so essentially, why, what happened is that if they're funding all these right-wing think tanks and these neoliberal think tanks, the rest of their agenda is a very right-wing agenda. It's like less taxes, small government, all that sort of neoliberal agenda. So what they've done is they politicised. Um, climate science, so it's almost like left and right now. You know, if, if, if you know if you're on the Republican in the U.S. these days, you don't you don't accept the science of climate change. You don't believe in it, and that's actually had a huge effect on U.S. legislation. It's why the U.S. has not been able to act. And I mean, look at the presidential campaigns today. There's not one single Republican candidate who accepts the science of climate change. So yeah, it's had a huge, so, so I think in exposing that, we're starting to shift the public and start, we're certainly starting to shift the media in the US, but there's still a long way to go. What role does resources like Skeptical Science have in, in helping communicators and scientists to respond to the misinformation? Well, Skeptical Science is great because it actually can give you and give a lot of media some understanding of the reality behind the science and, 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 and the ridiculousness of the claims that these, these, um, these deniers have been making. And I think, you know, I think it's played a fantastic role in when people don't understand it, and especially journalists, they go to skepticalscience.com and they can actually get the full truth about about the um, you know ab ab about what these deniers are saying, and there's also the 97% consensus, which has been absolutely huge. It's quiz tweeted by Obama. It's been absolutely huge in, in, in actually convincing people. So it's one of those facts that people see. They say, oh, okay, 97% of scientists agree with this. They don't really. People don't want to be in the 3%. So I think that's had a huge impact as well. So we're only a couple of days away from the end of COP. How do you think it's going? And, and what, what's your perspective on the last week and a half? Everything is open. Everything is open. Um, we still don't know. Uh, you know, we're hoping to get agreement that we should keep warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, as someone said yesterday, um, if the world, you know, whether we can actually get to 1.5, we can limit warming to 1.5. It's going to be very, very difficult, but if you aim for 1.5, we might at least keep warming below 2. And that's, that's the most important thing. That's the most important thing in play here. Because if you look at 1.5, to do that you need full decarbonisation by mid-century of, of our energy system. And also, you need to get the... Um, if you have less warming, then there's less finance is going to be there for adaptation and finance, finance is a huge issue here. There's going to be less compensation needs to be paid for the liability, you know, for, for, for the loss and damage that, that countries and people are suffering that they can't adapt to. So, you know, it's, it's, it's right at the centre of all of this. You know, we're stuck on finance, we're stuck on loss and damage. The US is worried as anything about compensation and liability, but, you know, as one of the small island state ministers said the other day, yep, if we don't have that much more, you won't have to pay so much. So why do you get on and cut emissions? And that's the main thing. But what we've also seen is, you know, very much sort of a push by, you know, the, the oil producers, the Saudis, absolutely, you know, ruling out anything, blocking everything. And um, also big coal, coal, coal countries like India, um, you know, blocking, you know, with their coal companies all behind them and everything, blocking progress. And that's, you know, it's, you can see the influence of the fossil fuel industry coming through.
And people ask me, because I've worked on climate change for so long, they ask me, what would you do to stop climate change, Cindy? And I say, four words, separate oil and state. And that's, that's it. If you break that influence between the fossil fuel industry and governments, and you know, that's, you'll actually get movement because the people want it. People want to see it, it, it work.